We're going to start in Isaiah 24 in just a moment. Uh, we did not get all the way through chapter 23 last time we met. Uh, but if we have to cancel for weather again, I'm going to run out of makeup days. So we got, we've got to go quickly because I can't risk it. So uh, what I would like to do is just kind of summarize chapter 23. Um, and what I'll do is I'm going to kind of just survey first 23 chapters, and I'll kind of pick chapter 23 up at the end. So chapters 1 through 6, Isaiah pictures Israel as it is and Israel as it could be. Right, So we get Israel as it is, which is not good, and Israel as it could be, and let me say Israel as it will be, and we're not just talking about the physical land of Israel, but about a new mountain of God that's going to be established. And I think the New Testament would tell us that these are the people who are in Christ. And these are people who are devoted to God's will, and they are changed from the inside out so that they will walk in God's ways, and they find peace and security and happiness. All right. Now, uh, maybe joy would be a better word. In chapters 7 through 12, we get a test for, I, for Ahaz, the current king. And the test is, ask God for a sign so that you will trust him and not Assyria. See, Ahaz recognized that Assyria was the danger on the world stage. And so what he thought he could do was pay tribute to Assyria. Assyria would protect him. And God's saying, this is not going to end well for you. Trust me. Ask me for what sign you want, and I'll give it to you. And Ahaz says, oh, I would not test the Lord by asking for a sign. He's framing this in a very pious way, but really he's already got his mind made up about what he wants to do. And in response to that, God says, I am going to give you a sign, and it's going to be a child born of a virgin that they will call Emmanuel. We find out more about this child that's going to be born. Chapter 9, he's going to be a king like his father David, but of his kingdom there will be no end. In chapter 11, we find out more about this king. He will reign in righteousness and in justice. And in his kingdom where he reigns, lions will lay down with lambs and children will play with snakes. I know that sounds horrifying, but it is a, it is a kingdom of peace and it is a kingdom where there is no more animosity between the citizens of this kingdom. And the way that that's going to happen is God is going to exalt a king. He is going to exalt the branch of Jesse. And he is going to be a rallying point for all the nations. And to him, the Gentiles will find, in him, the Gentiles will find their hope. So that's chapters 1 through 6. Israel as it is and Israel as it can and will be. A test of trust, chapters 7 through 12. And then chapters 13 through 23 is, why not trust the nations? Why not ally and put your dependence on and put your confidence in the nations? Why not trust them instead of trusting God? And so we go through several different nations. We go through Babylon and Moab and Ethiopia and Egypt and, uh, and uh, who else? The Philistines and, and on and on. And in chapter 23, we come to Tyre. Now, I'll go back to chapter 13 to 23 in just a second. But let's look at chapter 23. So you notice that this is about Tyre. Now, if you remember on the map, Tyre is in the very northern portions of what we would think of as maybe the land of Canaan. But it's on, it's on the very northern side. Uh, Phoenicia, the Phoenicians, were the residents of Tyre. And anybody know anything about the, Tyre, the Tyrians, the people who were from Tyre? What were they known for? Trading. That's right. So that's why in verse 1 we have, How ye ships of Tarshish, for it is laid waste. Now Tarshish is on the other side. But they would be upset because their trading partner on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea is going to be destroyed. Uh, they're going to be devastated. And as you read verses 1 through 7, that is going to be the, the verdict. Now, it seems to me that the devastation that's being talked about here is the devastation that is coming... Um, as, as an Assyrian judgment. Now, there will be other times that Tyre will be judged later, and Ezekiel will talk about those judgments, and I think maybe most fully fulfilled, not until maybe the time of Alexander the Great when he raises Tyre to the ground. But in verse 7, he says, Is this your joyous city whose antiquity is of ancient days? Her own feet shall carry her off afar off to sojourn. In other words, she's going to be marched away like exiles. Now, the important thing, I think, to note about the judgment on Tyre is who is bringing it. Look at verse 8. 
Who hath taken this counsel against Tyre? Whose idea was this? The crowning city, whose merchants are princes, whose traffickers are the honorable of the earth. Look at verse 9. The Lord of hosts hath purposed it, to stain the pride of all glory and to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. Pass through the thine land as a river, O daughter of Tarshish, there is no more strength. He stretched out his hand over the sea. He shook the kingdoms. The Lord hath given a commandment against the, the Canaanites or against the merchant city to destroy the strongholds thereof. Now, all the way down in verse 18, there is a glimmer of hope for the people of Tyre. Her, merchant, her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. There has been some debate over what that means for the hope of Tyre. Because we never really do see Tyre, um, at least in the Old Testament, become a place where God, uh, where, where the Israelites have any power or anything like that. There are a couple of things that may be a part of this. First of all, there may be a reference, uh, there is a reference in Ezra chapter 3 that there are goods that come from Tyre to help in the rebuilding of the temple. So right now, Tyre is going to be demolished. But that's not going to be the end of it. In fact, the things that Tyre produces are actually going to serve a holy purpose. They're going to be devoted to the building of the temple. But it may even point to the fact that there are going to be those from Tyre who themselves are devoted to the Lord that they are going to come into God's kingdom, and that would be in the Messianic age. So I know that's just a brief survey of chapter 23, but I think it's sufficient to get the point. Tire this wealthy trading center, don't depend on them, because one day their wealth is going to flow to God's city anyway. One day their wealth is going to come and be devoted to God anyway. So let me summarize chapters 13 through 23 like this. Babylon, who's talked about in 13 and 14, was the glory of the nations. Now, what was the value? What was the 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 uh, what stock should they put in the fact that Babylon was the glory of the nations? Well, look up, look at chapter fourteen, verse four. You will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon: how the oppressor has ceased, the insolent fury ceased. So, what value was Babylon as the glory of the nations? Nothing. That's right. Uh, what about the scheming of the nations? These are going to be the nation's plans and their, their uh, alliances and their political calculations. Look at chapter 14 and verse 32. What will one answer the messengers of the nation? This is the, Philist, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the uh, Philistines who have come and they're trying to make an alliance with Israel. What will, the, what will you answer them? The Lord has founded Zion and in her the afflicted of his people find refuge. No need for that alliance. Don't need the Philistine alliance. Over in chapter 18 and verse 2, talking about the Ethiopians and all the alliances that they will make. Go, you swift messengers, to a nation tall and smooth, to a people feared near and far, a nation mighty and conquering, whose land the river divide. As, as I'm interpreting that passage, what God is saying to the Ethiopians is, go back home. No need for all of this busy work and all these alliances. So what's the value of the scheming of the nations? Nothing. That's right. Uh, what about the wisdom of the nations? So this would be the Egyptians in chapter 19 and verse 3. And the spirit of the Egyptians within them will be emptied out, and I will confound their counsel. They will inquire of the idols and the sorcerers and the mediums and the necromancers, and I will give over the Egyptians into the hands of a hard master, and a fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord of hosts. What will be the value of the wisdom of the nations? Nothing. I will confound their counsel, he says. What about the resistance of the nations? Look at 21 and verse 9. Behold, here come riders, horsemen in pairs. And he answered, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the carved images of her gods he has shattered the ground. Babylon was the major resistance against Assyria. What value will the resistance of the nations be? Nothing. I think you're seeing a trend here, right? Um, what about the wealth of the nations? We've just looked at Tyre. What about the wealth of the nations? What value will that be? Nothing. What about the gods of the nations? We just read from 21.9 where the gods of Babylon lie crushed to the ground. 
uh, Moab in chapter 16 and verse 12, it talks about them crying out to their gods. And what will their gods do for them? Nothing. And Egypt in chapter 19 and verse 1, it says the nothings or the idols of Egypt will tremble. What value will the gods of Egypt be? Nothing. All right, so if the glory of the nations, the scheming of the nations, the wisdom of the nations, the resistance of the nations, the wealth of the nations, and the gods of the nations all amount to nothing, then why would you put your trust in the nations? Don't, right? Now, here's the lesson. Do people put their trust in scheming and their deals and their alliances and their partnerships more than they trust in God? Yes, they do. Do people put trust in the wisdom of this age more than they trust God? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, they do. Do people put trust in wealth more than they trust God? Do people put trust in their ability to resist whatever it is more than God? Do people put trust in the gods of this age, which are not all that different from the gods of that age, like power and lust and pride? Yes, they put their trust in all those things. But there's no reason to do so because all of those things will be brought to naught. Now we come to chapter 24. Chapter 24 has been called Isaiah's little apocalypse. What does that mean? The word apocalypse means revelation or unveiling. In fact, the book of Revelation, Revelation 1 verse 1, the apocalypse or the revelation of Jesus Christ. The idea of an apocalypse is it's something that gives you a peek behind the curtain, right? It's something that allows you to see what is going on past earth level. Now, from an earth level perspective, there are historical explanations for the rise and fall of Israel and Judah, and for the rise and fall of Assyria, and rise and fall of Babylon, and Persia, and Greece, and Rome. But when you look at, the, at those things through, through the veil, through the apocalypse, you realize, from what the Bible tells us, that there's much more going on than just the historical rise and fall of nations. That what we're talking about is a cosmic conflict between good and evil. And the, the rise and fall of nations are simply how that plays out on our plane. But there's a lot more going on than we can really see. Isaiah 24 through 27 frames all of this in terms of the just and the wicked. And one writer said, summing up 24 through 27, all history comes to the point where the just are rewarded and the wicked are punished. I don't think there's a better way of summarizing chapters 24 through 27 than that point right there. All history will come to the point where the just will be rewarded and the wicked will be punished. Now, we've already seen that in small amounts in chapters 13 through 23. All the wicked of the nations will be judged and the righteous will be delivered. Israel, the, the true Israel, will be delivered. But if there was any nation left out of the list from 13 to 23, and for all time to come, rest assured that all history comes to the point where the just are rewarded and the wicked are punished. And we will see that unveiled through chapters 24 through 27. Now, sometimes when we read chapters 24 through 27, it looks like we're talking about the very end of time. I think in some senses we might be. Because whoever, whatever wickedness might escape until then, there is coming the day where it won't escape. And whatever justice might fail to be rewarded until then, there is coming a day where it will not fail to be rewarded. And so all of the judgments on the nations from chapters 13 through 23 and all of the rewards for the righteous up through this point of the book of Isaiah are just previews of that final day that's coming. So we can look at chapters 24 through 27. I think that the point of chapter 24 is that all of God's enemies will face the judgment that they are due. We might not be around to see it but they all will face the judgment that they are due. So let's look at chapter 24. The word earth is used a lot in order to indicate that we are talking about something that is global. In other words, nobody will escape. So look at verse 1. Behold, the Lord maketh 
the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. So it is universal in scope. God's judgment is universal in scope. There's nobody that escapes geographically, but also, verse 2, it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so the giver of usury to him. What class of people escapes the judgment of God? None. Not one. Nobody will, so we can say, who escapes the judgment of God? No, not one. No, not one. As we sang, this, but that would put a slightly different flavor on that song. Now, the land, he says, now when you see the word land in the King James versions, other translations will render that differently from time to time. Maybe the earth, um, verse 3, uh, the word land there is the word earth, and the translators have just made a decision to render it differently. I'm not sure why they made that decision, but they did. But the earth shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languishes and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. Now, why, is there, why are they going to face this judgment? Look at verse 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. There is a covenant that God has made with all of humanity. Now, it's not the same covenant that He made with Israel and Judah, but there is a covenant. Think about the covenant of Genesis 9, where He says, anybody who takes one life, his life will be expected of him. We've, or he will be taken from him. We've seen throughout this book that the nations don't have regard for the life of others. Assyria, especially, is a nation that does treats other people with contempt and disregard. But there's other ways in which they've broken the covenant and disobeyed God and violated His will. Now, because they've broken the covenant, therefore, verse 6, the earth hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. All right, so the point of verses 1 through 6 is to say that God is bringing judgment on all the wicked. Now that will happen in increments along the way. But whatever does not take place now will take place ultimately. It will be, all be taken care of. All right, any thoughts through verse 6 that you would like to make note of? Okay, there is a theme throughout these chapters, 24 through 27, about the cities. There is a righteous city and there is a wicked city. We're introduced to the wicked city in verse 10. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up so that no one may come in. There is crying for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the earth is gone. In the city is left desolation, and the gate is smitten with destruction. When thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. In other words, the earth is about to be harvested, and there's not going to be anything left. In verse 14, these are the righteous. These are those who have been oppressed by the wicked responding to that. They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore glorify ye the Lord in the, in the fires, even in the, na even the name of the Lord our God, Israel, in the isles of the sea. From the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous. So, those who are those who are faithful, those who are trusting God, look at God's justice and what do they do in response? They praise Him, right? They praise God for His justice. That's a right thing to do. But, verse 16, But I said, this is Isaiah, My leanness, my leanness. Now, how does the English standard render that? It, it looks like uh, the middle of verse 16 I, yes, I waste away. I waste away. Woe is me, for the traitors have betrayed. With, the, with betrayal, the traitors have betrayed. Um, God's righteousness, what does that mean for Judah? If God is going to be righteous and just, what's that going to mean for wicked Judah? Their punishment. That's right. I think we're seeing another place where we kind of have two sides of the judgment coin. The one side of the righteous that says, that is, that is right, that is good. And the other side that says, 
But oh, how grievous it is. Oh, how painful it is to see. And so Isaiah is reflecting that. Fear the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he that cometh out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open and the foundations of the earth do shake. You talk about a bad day. Here's a person who gets trapped by a pit. They climb their way out of the pit and they fall into a snare. And uh, there's a country song that says, this ain't my day tonight. And that's, what, that's exactly what, what's happening right here. Uh, this guy, and you remember the story in Amos about the man, he like, runs from the lion and then he runs into a bear and then he runs from the bear and he finally gets home, he's panting, he puts his hand up on the wall and he gets bit by a snake. Like, whew, I've had some days like that, right? Where it would just been better if we just didn't get up out of bed that day. But anyway, the earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly. It shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, it shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. After many days they shall be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously uh, and or his glory will be before his elders. All right, so you have a day, chapter 24, when all the wicked of the earth will be judged. And in that day, God will be exalted. And God alone will be exalted. Okay, anything through 24 that you would like to say? I think the point is clear. Maybe sometimes the specific phrases are not as clear, but we can see Isaiah's point. He's brought us through, what, 11 chapters of all the nations. They're turning to other things. They're not trusting in God. Judgment's going to come. Chapter 24 is kind of like a tail end of that and saying, listen, it doesn't matter what they put their trust in. If it's not God, they're going to be faced. They're going to face judgment. The whole earth is going to face judgment. Chapter twenty-five. Oh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, that's very good. So there, I would say that most of what's being described is the judgment that Assyria, that God is using Assyria for. So this would be in about the 700s B.C., maybe into the 600s a little bit, where God is using Assyria to judge all these nations around. There would be other times where these nations would get big again, and then they would be judged again. So it may apply to those as well. Now, chapter 24, I think, is kind of just an overall summary of whenever God brings a judgment. Does that make sense? So... What I would say about that is, whenever any nation falls because of their wickedness, Isaiah 24 is being fulfilled. The wicked are being judged in all the earth. And then one day, when the end of all time comes, that will be the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah 24. Does that make sense? Okay, so when, uh, when, when Assyria falls, Isaiah in 24 would say, See, I told you all the wicked were going to be judged. When Babylon, see, I told you all the wicked would be judged. And on and on and on. And then finally, at the very end of time, I think Isaiah could say, did you read 24? I told you all the earth, all the wicked of the earth were going to be judged. And, and so this kind of serves as a, it's a way of thinking about all of history. All of history points to the day when the wicked are judged and the righteous are rewarded. Okay? Now 25 and 26 are going to focus more on in some ways, on the righteous, but judgment is, is still clearly in view. All right, so, O Lord, Thou art my God, I will exalt Thee, I will praise Thy name, for Thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Now, how can he say that? How can he say that God is always faithful and true? Because you've made the city, now this is the wicked city, a heap. Defense city a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. Therefore the shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of terrible nations shall fear thee. They are going to recognize God's power. Because you have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. When the wicked of the world are beating against the poor and the needy, what has God been for them? He's been a refuge. All right? So the justice that God brings against the wicked is terrible for them. But the righteous say, you have been our refuge. 
You have taken care of us. You have protected us. Thou shalt bring down the noise of the strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, and the branch of the terrible one shall be brought low. Now notice, this is what happens after the judgment comes. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people. So all people are going to be judged, but look who's invited to the feast. All people, a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the leaves well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain over the face of the covering, the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil over all nations. Now in verse 7, before we get to verse 8, what is the covering that is cast over all peoples? What is the veil that is spread over all nations that God's going to destroy? What is the one thing that all nations and all people face? Death. Verse 8, He will swallow up death in victory. So, all the world's going to be judged. No wicked will escape. But all the world is invited to a great feast. And all the world is, is welcome to the day when God will swallow up death and victory. Think about that picture. Here is death like a monster that swallows the whole world. It covers the whole earth. And God breaks it up and chops it up and He swallows death in victory. By death, Christ crushed death to death. And the Lord will wipe away, verse 8, tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of His people shall He take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken. So just like there is a day of judgment that is coming on all the earth, there is a day of joy and of security and of peace and of rescue and of salvation for all people. And it's pictured here as both a feast and a, and a funeral, but it's the funeral for death. Death is the one that's being destroyed. Now, you will recognize passages like He will swallow up death in victory because that's exactly what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. And he says that when Isaiah wrote that, he was pointing forward to the resurrection of this body. That one day when we are raised, then will be the fulfilled the saying, Paul says. Death is swallowed up in victory so that Paul can boast. He can taunt death and say, Death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Because if this body is going to be raised, death can't do nothing. And so, death will be crushed. It will be swallowed up in victory. And in that day, verse 9, it shall be said, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in salvation. I love this in verse 9. It will be said in that day, this is our God. Now, can you imagine in, in the wranglings and the political dealings of the 7th and 8th century B.C., people saying, your God is not going to deliver you. God is not going to save you. If you don't make this alliance, or if you don't put your trust in this idol, or if you don't, if you don't get wealth from Tyre, or you don't sign this tribute to Assyria, if you don't do that, your God is not going to be able to deliver you. And then at the end of all that, God has been vindicated. He has rescued the righteous. And all the righteous are able to point to Him and say, this is our God. We have been vindicated in putting our trust in Him. We waited for Him and He saved us. Now the word wait there is not just like we were just sitting here and saying, well, I wonder what's going to happen, right? It's a word very closely related to trust or hope. We put our confidence in Him. We did what He said, even when it wasn't the easy path. We put our trust in Him, and He has come through. He has been faithful. We waited for Him, and He will save us, or He has saved us. They were true to the true God all along, and they have been found to be right in that. And so they say, this is the Lord. Not only is He our God, He is the God. He is the Lord. He is the I Am. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. Now, I, I think that we can take that and internalize that. And we can say, when we trust God's way, and we do it God's way, even when the world would say do it a different way, there will come a day, all history is pointing to the day, where the just will be rewarded and the wicked will be, will be destroyed. And we, who put our trust in God, will be able one day to say, we have trusted in Him all along, and He has saved us. And all the people who said, you got to do it this way, and you've got to trust the world's wisdom, and don't put your stock in that faith, they will be destroyed. 
and we will be vindicated. 4, verse 10, In this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest, and Moab, who I think is a picture of people who have rejected God's sanctuary, look back at chapter 16 that Austin took you through, shall be trodden down under him, even as straw is trodden down for the dunghill. And he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of them, as they that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim. And he shall bring down their pride together with the spoils of their hands. They will try to escape, but there will be no, there, there will be no avail. And the fortress of the high fort of thy walls shall he bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, even to the dust. All right, so chapter 24, there is coming a day where all the wicked will face judgment. But that's not the only side of the story. There's also coming a day where all of those who have waited on the Lord, who have put their trust in Him and waited for His salvation, there will come a day where they will be welcomed to a feast where death is no more. Tears are wiped away from faces. And of course, the book of Revelation picks up that language. and says there will be no more mourning or crying or pain or death and the curse will be removed. And that is heaven. So, is there a sense in which Isaiah 25 is fulfilled in what we now have in Christ? Yes, death has already been defeated. But we don't have everything that Isaiah was looking forward to because we're waiting for death's final blow. We're waiting for it to finally be subjected to, to the kingdom of God. Any thoughts through 25? All right, let's look at 26. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah, we have a strong city. Here's the righteous city in contrast to that wicked city of chapter 24 and 5. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Isaiah speaking to God. Thou wilt keep him in the perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. I love this verse. Uh, I'm going to talk about this in the invitation in just a minute. But... The word there, perfect peace, it doesn't say perfect peace in the original. It says shalom, shalom, peace, peace. You will keep him in peace, peace, because his mind is stayed on thee. Rather than his mind and his heart resting on Assyria, or on Babylon, or on wealth, or on wisdom, or on idols, his mind rests, his mind stays on the Lord. That's where it finds its, his foundation. And because of that, let the nations do what they will. He will be kept in perfect peace. Now the word peace here is not just absence from trouble. right? We have been given peace in Christ. That doesn't mean we're not going to have trouble. In fact, he calls us to take up a cross. right? That doesn't mean no trouble. But it is wholeness. It is, it is the, the, the recognition of our lives being in harmony with God that, that there's, there is absence of trouble between Him and us, and that we can face all of life's difficulties recognizing that we are exactly as, as we ought to be. So, if the one who is kept in perfect peace is kept in perfect peace because his mind is stayed on the Lord, look at verse 4, trust in the Lord forever. For in the Lord, Jehovah, is everlasting strength, or is an everlasting rock. There is safety, there is security, there is strength, there is salvation in the Lord. Verse 5, For He bringeth down them that dwell on the high. On high, The lofty city He layeth low, He layeth it low even to the ground and bringeth it to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. So, you trust in God. Because if you don't trust in God and you trust in yourself, you're going to be associated with the proud city and you're going to be brought low. Any thoughts through verse 6? Verse 7, the way of the just is, my text says, uprightness, but most texts, I think modern translations say level. So the word really is the way of the just is just. But the word just here means level. It means in line. So the person who walks in line with God's will will find their path in line with their feet. The way of the just is level. And so what he says is, Thou most upright, that's the Lord, doth weigh or make level the path of the just. In other words, the person who walks in accordance with God's principles will find that their path, 
that every step fits along the way. Now, that may not always seem like the case. It may seem like the just face more difficulty than the wicked do sometimes. But what's the point of verses of chapters 24 through 27? That all history is pointing to the day where the just are rewarded and the wicked are punished. And so as a result of that, even the days that are difficult for the just, as long as they're walking in accordance with God's principles, are leading them exactly where they need to go. They're taking them exactly to the place where they need to be. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, we have waited for thee. That is, because of what you have said, in the way, in, that's, what does the text say? Yea, in the way of thy judgments. Uh, verse 8 in the English Standard says, uh, in the path of your judgments. In other words, what you have decreed and what you have said, that's where we're going to walk. We have waited for you there. We've put our trust in you. We're going to do what you say. The desire of thy soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. The just, these people, whose mind is kept, who's kept in perfect peace, what is their greatest desire? What do they want most of all? Look at the end of verse 8. For God. That's right. Their greatest desire, their greatest pursuit is that God would be glorified, that He would be remembered. Your name and remembrance are the desire of our soul. Verse 9, with my soul I have desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me I will seek thee diligently or earnestly. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Now verse 10 is interesting. It says, if favor is shown to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. That's true, isn't it? Some, m m often, that is true. So that makes me think of Romans chapter 2, where Israel and Judah have... They, they're in sin. I say Israel and Judah. The Jews as a whole are in sin. And Paul says that they have used the patience of God as an excuse to continue in their sin. And he says what you should have done is you should have considered the patience of God as a call to repent, but they had not done so. And what happens is sometimes mercy, the weight to judge and give them life instead of judgment, they don't learn righteousness. In the land of the uprightness, he will deal just, unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. They will not see God's royal supremacy. They won't see his sovereignty. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they shall see. And be ashamed of their, for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemy shall devour them. Right now, they don't see God. But there's coming a day where the wicked will. And when they do, they're going to be ashamed of the direction that they have taken. But, verse 12, Lord, Thou will ordain peace for us, for You have indeed done for us all our works. I think the point there is, is God has done everything for these people that they could not do for themselves. They couldn't protect themselves from the Assyrians. The righteous can't protect themselves from the enemy of God's people, but God can protect them. And so if we put our trust in Him, He will protect us. O Lord our God, other lords beside Thee have had dominion over us. Um, are they talking about foreign nations? Maybe. Maybe they're talking about other gods that they have entrusted themselves to. But now they've turned back to Him. He says, but by Thee only will we bring remembrance of Thy name. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore Thou hast visited and destroyed them and made all their memory perish. Talking about the other lords that had ruled over them. Thou hast increased the nation, O Lord. Thou hast increased the nation. Thou art glorified. Thou hast removed it far unto the, all the ends of the earth. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when, when chastening was upon them. I think the um, English standard says they poured out a whispered prayer. Uh, I think the idea here is they, all they could do, the only thing that we contributed to this, they're saying is, we whispered out a prayer. We cried for help. And what did God do? You have responded. All right. Uh, let's drop down to uh, verse 18. We have been with child and we have been in pain. We have, we have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. In other words, by our own actions and by what we have done, we have not been able to do one thing about the nations that are challenging us. We are completely dependent on the Lord. We can't bring it about on our own. 
Verse 19, Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. I believe that verse 19 is pointing forward to a day where the righteous are going to be vindicated ultimately by a resurrection. Now there are some senses maybe in which he's talking about the nation as a whole is going to be revived and taken care of. But ultimately this is true in a literal sense. Thy dead shall live. The people who are in Christ, who are righteous, even though it may not seem like they are going to be on the right side of history, quote unquote, they will be vindicated in the resurrection. Because there's a day when all the wicked will be judged and all the righteous will be saved. All right. Very good. Chapter 27. Any thoughts through chapter 26? We're almost finished. Everybody okay? I know it's a lot. I'm talking a lot. Okay. All right. Chapter 27. In that day, the Lord with His sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, that piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Okay, what is going on here? What is Leviathan? Anybody, anybody have an idea about Leviathan? Yeah, we do read about it in Job. That's right. So, Leviathan may have been an actual creature of some sort. In fact, as we look at the description in Job, it sounds something like a dinosaur or something. But I think in most places, and maybe even in Job, that the way that Leviathan is being used is it is a monster that is used to represent chaos and opposition to God's forces. So there is this mythical creature, Leviathan, the enemy of God and His people. And what is God going to do to this monster that causes chaos and wickedness? He's going to punish it. He's going to kill it with a sword. And so perhaps we see here, uh, some of this same language is used in Revelation, right, to talk about the judgment of the great dragon, which is Satan. In that day, sing ye unto her a vineyard of red wine. Does anybody remember a song about a vineyard in Isaiah? Chapter 5. Because there is a song about a vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5. Now, remember that vineyard, right? What did God do for that vineyard? Everything. Did everything for it. And what did that vineyard produce? He said, I went to look for grapes and I got stink berries. Remember? I got, I got bad grapes. Okay. So he goes and then he says, I'm going to let thorns grow up and I'm going to tear down the wall and I'm going to let people trample over it. Now that is the Israel as it was in the day of Isaiah. An, an, an Israel that was a vineyard for God that he had done everything for and they had just said, we don't want what you've got. And he says, I'm going to tear down that wall. But look at, look at this, verse 3. This is, this is a new Israel. I, the Lord, do keep it. I will water it every moment. Lest any hurt it, I will protect it night and day. Wrath is not in me. Which is amazing to think about in the book of Isaiah, right? Wrath is not in me. Not anymore. It's been taken care of. Who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together. All right, so remember in the old vineyard, Israel as it was, God says, I'm going to let the thorns and briars go over it. Not this new Israel. This new Israel, if any thorns and briars want to come up against it, I will burn them up. But look at verse 5. Or... Let them take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. What? Think about this. The briars and the thorns that are opposing God's plan and trying to destroy God's people, God says, if any thorns and briars try to oppose me and, and protecting my people, I will burn them up. Or those thorns and briars that are opposing me can just take hold of me and I'll bring them in too. That's a beautiful picture that people who had opposed God's purposes could grab hold of him and he would say, let's make peace. And he would bring them in. He shall cause them that come out of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Israel will be fruitful again, right? Not produce the bad grapes that they had been producing in Isaiah 5. Now, I don't think we're talking about national Israel anymore. I think we're talking about a new Israel, a reshaped Israel, an Israel that is in Christ. Hath he smitten him as he smote those that smote him? Uh, in other words, has God struck Israel for the same reason and with the same conclusion as the nations that opposed Israel? It has been for the same reasons, maybe in some ways. 
Maybe it's been because he expected even more of Israel. But it has not been the same conclusion. In measure, when it shooteth forth, thou wilt debate with it. He stayed his rough wind in the day of these when I think the New American Standard renders this helpfully. You contended with them by banishing them, by driving them away. With his fierce wind, he has expelled them on the day of the east wind. So what has God done to judge them? He's exiled them. But verse 9, by this, that is by the exile that he makes mention of in verse 8, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this is all the fruit to take away his sin, when he maketh all the stones of his altar as chalk stones that are beaten sunder, and the groves of his images shall not, uh, shall not stand up. In other words, by God's exile of the nation, they're going to come back and they're not going to turn to idolatry anymore. They're going to be purged of that wickedness. They're going to learn that lesson. Now, the defense city, the city right now, it's going to be judged. Why? Verse 11, For it is a people of no understanding. Therefore, he that made them will not have mercy on them, and he that formed them will show them no favor. So, right now, this city is going to be judged. But verse 12, It shall come to pass in that day, that the Lord shall start his threshing from the channel of the river into the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. So, it's going to look like all hope is lost, and but there's coming a day where even the ones who look like they were ready to go extinct are going to be gathered back together and they're going to worship God in His holy mountain. The point of 24 through 27 is that there is coming a day in which all the just will be rewarded and all the wicked will face punishment. And the day of the just reward will be a feast day where death is swallowed up forever. Because that day is coming, we can stay on the Lord. We can rest on Him. We can have Him as our confidence. Because... All the other things that people trust in, chapters 13 through 23, are worthless. They're nothing. But we, this is our God. We will wait on Him. He is the Lord. We will wait on Him and He will save us. And there will come a day of joy and salvation when He does that. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.